official 1995 edition of Artifacts. Now, coming up, we've got some fascinating folks here to talk about multimedia and interactive video, also theater, dance, and the Loring Neighborhood Action Plan. It'll be a great show. Stay with us. Hello everyone, I'm Janet Zahn. And I'm Phil Lindsay, and this is Artifacts. This is the show in which we talk about the arts and related issues as they happen here in the Minneapolis area. Now, you know, it was occurring to me, Janet, that 94 was a pretty good year in the good. fields that we cover. Absolutely. I mean, the Absolutely. movie industry seemed to really keep going here in the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. The feature film industry is good, but particularly the, the local folks, the commercial uh, producers and the corporate producers had a very good year. I've heard a lot of good reports from everyone, and mm -hmm. the exciting thing is that um, in 95, we're going to be doing a new economic impact study of the oh. film and video industry, and we'll find out just how good a year it was. Oh, and that'll be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the arts uh, and the other disciplines in the Minneapolis area did pretty well in 94. Mm -hmm. um, there was some dislocation in the visual arts, I think, with some of the galleries mm -hmm. kind of coming and going. Um, but pretty much, I think they held their own. I think the interesting thing is going to be in 95 with the changes happening out in mm -hmm. Washington. Ooh, we have to watch um, it very carefully. What's going to happen mm -hmm. uh, as the months go by. So we'll keep you posted. You bet. All right. Our first guests today are Tom Donahue and Tim Desley of Cray Research. Tom is from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, and they're going to take you on a guided tour through the world of multimedia and interactive video. Then I'll be talking with the Jungle Theater's Bane Belke, followed by a look at the Loring Neighborhood Action Plan, at least the arts component of that plan. That'll be Gretchen Nichols coming here to tell us about that. And we'll wrap it all up with Wendy Ansley and Michael Engel, who are two dancers who will be uh, talking about some arts curriculum they've developed for the Minneapolis Public Schools. It'll be a fun hour, and we'll start it all with a look at some of the stuff that Tom and Tim brought us. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Janet Zahn, and with me today are two people who have agreed to talk with me about this rapidly expanding information universe out there. Uh, this is Tom Donahue here from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design and Tim Desley from Cray Research. And to start out, I would just like both of you to tell me what you do in relations, relation to this multimedia interactive world at your respective workplaces. <laughs> okay. um, well, I'm the Dean of Students at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, and I teach some multimedia courses and workshops, mm -hmm. and there are a large variety of them uh, at MCAD for graphic designers, illustrators, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I work uh, developing multimedia programs myself, and uh, I've been involved in it for a long time. I guess I started uh, full-time in 1981. But your interest in this started a long, long time ago. Yeah, when I was a graduate student in 64, I, I heard about what multimedia was eventually going to be. And when that happened, I fig when I heard about it, I figured mm -hmm. that's what I want to do when I grow up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I grew up, and <laughs> now I'm doing it. Here it is, yeah. <laughs> Tim? I work at Cray Research in the Marketing Communications Department, and I develop multimedia for Cray. Mm -hmm. And it's a good sales tool for mm -hmm. um, for our marketing department. Um, to s we sell pretty expensive computers, and mm -hmm. to s uh, sell high tech, you got to look like you need, you know, know how to use it. Mm -hmm. So, so we try to make um, these tools real easily available to our marketing department. Mm -hmm. and then I also teach um, uh, at night at uh -huh. the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Mm -hmm. I teach uh, multimedia and uh, sort of um, 
sort of the hybrid media classes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he was my teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I, I took a course in animation uh -huh, from uh -huh. him. It was really good. Well, that's Highly great. recommend it. <laughs> They're fun classes. They really are. Oh, well, I bet they, they are. are. They and we'll talk about that a little bit okay. later. But um, I'd like to start out first of all with um, I want to uh, talk about basic vocabulary here. We've already been tossing mm -hmm. around a lot of terms, oh. and so I would like first to start out with Tom. You get the first it's a quiz, question. Right? <laughs> first quiz, yeah. What is multimedia? It's in a, in almost whatever anybody wants to define it as. Mm -hmm. It used to be a slide tape show with sound. Right. And it sort of evolved from there to just include very many different kinds of multimedia. Mm -hmm. Interactive multimedia is um, used a lot in learning or in point of sale and other things, but that's when you can control what's happening, what kind of media you're seeing, stills, text, video, graphics. You and actually interact yes, with right. the media as a human being. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Tim, what is um, uh, CD-ROM? CD-ROM is a media that's like much like a CD you put in your audio, your stereo, mm -hmm. uh, at your home or in your car. Mm -hmm. But CD-ROM uh, actually stores information, like on a computer. Mm -hmm. So you can um, interact with it. Um, and this is a CD-ROM. And the information is kept on here in a couple of different formats. Mm -hmm. But you can use it in your computer or uh, an, in a player. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon you'll be able to go to the library and check out a CD-ROM mm -hmm. rather than a book. Mm -hmm. And they'll have, you know, handheld players that you'll mm -hmm. be able to slide the CD-ROMs and, mm -hmm. and read, read at your leisure. Mm -hmm. CD-ROM is um, sort of an interim technology. And, and pretty soon they'll, you'll be able to fit um, a two-hour uh, video mm -hmm. on, on just oh, one disc. So. Okay, tell me a little bit about um, the internet. Both of you can maybe handle this one a little bit. Oh, Tim knows more about that than I well, do. Well, it's been set up for many years. It's sort of like um, started with all of the um, uh, government labs sort of hooking together. Mm -hmm. And then people found out about it as a cheap way of sending information, mm -hmm. like back and forth uh, across, the, uh, across the country. Mm -hmm. And now you're able to send uh, text and graphics and mm -hmm. video over it. And it's becoming a good platform for uh, this multimedia mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty soon people won't need CD-ROMs anymore. You can just uh, dial into some place that has that information on a hard disk someplace mm -hmm. and download it and use it. Or you don't even have to download it. You can use it while it's still at the television station or mm -hmm. at the node, wherever it happens to be. A node is a, just a place where they've gathered a lot of data. Oh. See, this is all, it's all kind of overwhelming to me. I dabble in computers at a pretty basic level. And it's all, that's why I wanted to kind of go through and, and, and find out about this, this basic information that we keep hearing more and more about. And also then, I would like to talk about how these various media, multimedia um, tools are used in the world today, in the business world, for example, or in the, in the, in the teaching situation, too. And I know, Tom, you have some examples of how it's used yeah. as a learning tool. Well, I brought one along. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one that I've been working on, uh, actually, with the University of St. Thomas, but mm -hmm. I've had some of my students from the College of Art and Design working on mm -hmm. it. And this is a, probably the simplest form. Uh, you know, when a teacher teaches in the class, he's got to search back and forth to find where it is on the tape, especially if you want to show more than one right. video segment in your mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. And if you use a, a laser disc instead, it, you can get instant access to it, random access. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a book about accounting. Mm -hmm. And let's just, uh, the professor would then just read a barcode. Mm -hmm. And when he talks and so on, and when he's ready to just shoot across the room at wherever the uh, mm -hmm. laser disc happens to be, and the Hi. video will come up. My name is Chris Ford. And I'm Mr. Databit. What are we teaching today, Chris? Well, we're going to learn to read and analyze financial statements and learn about accounting and the generally accepted principles. Accounting! Oh, I love accounting. All those rows and columns of cute little numbers. I'd love to immerse myself in details. Yes, to barely wallow in the accuracy and numerical uh, perfection. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on a minute, data bit. Get a grip on yourself. Now, let's start at the beginning, OK? Business record keeping. And so now she has asked a question at the end of that little segment. Right. And then what do you do? Well, at the end, now, 
the professor would just talk after that. Right. She ends up by saying, how would you define accounting? Mm -hmm. And if it's in the classroom situation, the professor would talk. Okay. And after a little while, he'd, he'd read another barcode and watch something else. Oh, okay. But if a student were using this alone, they'd watch the video segment. Mm -hmm. And then they would, uh, let's say, how would you define accounting? And the first one says, the process of recording financial transactions and keeping records. Well, that sounds like what it is. So let's click on that mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And we'll get an answer. It's That's right. Accounting provides information for decision making and provides a structure to track and measure complicated transactions. And okay. So the student can go through, mm -hmm. and as they go through this, they can pick various kinds of, mm -hmm. of answers, and they choose the answer. If they get the wrong answer, they get more instruction. If they get the right answer, they just speed right through it. Mm -hmm. So the, the program, like the CD-ROM programs, sort of adjust. Mm -hmm. This is a very simple means it's a very inexpensive means. Uh, you buy a disc player and a television set mm -hmm. and a barcode reader for less than $1,000 for a learning station. Mm -hmm. That's a lot less than what you'd buy a computer for. Mm -hmm. And that's all you need to get started is a laser disc and then a booklet. Mm -hmm. So it's a real easy way for a student mm -hmm. to work. It's not, it's not as flexible as if you had a computer. Right. Uh, you can't do all the things that you can do with CD-ROM. Mm -hmm. But it's a kind of interactive video where you're, you're mm -hmm. controlling what video you're seeing or mm -hmm. hearing. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Let's talk a little bit about video games. Um, that certainly is something that most people have been exposed to over the last several years. What's happening on the video game scene? Well, there's a lot of um, the CD-ROM and yeah. CD technologies mm -hmm. re really taken over, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of the graphics, the, the you know the the graphics are more and more spectacular. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon, you'll see um, more and more peripherals or things that you add to your oh, game right, so right. so you can I could foresee you could hook mm -hmm. up a, um, a muscle sensor and you could play tennis and it wow. could tell how hard you were hitting the ball or and your golf swing yes yeah, golf swing yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah tell me if you were if you were a parent and you had a, a young child that well of course you know the kid I suppose would like the video games the most but if you were going to invest in some kind of a system kind of a basic CD-ROM system mm -hmm. um, what kind of a cost are they looking at? What's something to start with? Well, the, the home personal yeah. computer is a good place to start. Mm -hmm. And with that, you would get um, just a, a major choice of um, titles for NCD mm -hmm. ROMs. Mm -hmm. And some are very educational, mm -hmm. very, very well thought out, uh, the curricula mm -hmm. and all of that with, with each one of the titles is yeah. pretty interesting. And a lot so, of the games yeah. actually are, can be oh, really yeah. educational too. And, oh, I, yeah. and just a lot of fun for the kids mm -hmm. too. So. Yeah, and, and you can buy one of those computers for roughly $2,000, mm -hmm. a multimedia PC or a Macintosh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, for about $2,000, you can sort of be in the game and mm -hmm. do, be using multimedia and connecting onto the net and so on. And you should be able to, you know, be able to buy that and add on the peripheral things as you go along. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to be s stuck with a piece of equipment, are you, that is going to well, be... Well, they're almost all upgradable, I think. Yeah. Yes, okay. and, and the CD-ROM drives in most of the current uh, multimedia players now are, are fast enough for, for the titles, for mm -hmm. the graphics to come up. Okay. So um, now it, it's come of age, right. and I wouldn't hesitate to buy mm -hmm. one of those systems. Tim, another thing you mentioned already, too, that Cray Research uses the these kinds of um, technologies for sales tools mm -hmm. and that sort of thing and you brought along yes this is a, a gizmo this is a <laughs> cdi player uh -huh. and that's we found it a very useful tool mm -hmm. um the we use it in our trade show uh, settings mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um it's really nice because it's full motion video mm -hmm. um and it's it's um very easy to access we mm -hmm. set it up in a kiosk okay and um let's uh check the automotive and I'll show you a crash simulation done on a right. Cray supercomputer here. Okay. Um, and you can see that I'm traveling through the the layers of information. Mm -hmm. And here shows a, a real-time uh, crash to simulation. The mm -hmm. um, and now we simulate well, them on the computers. Mm -hmm. But to access this information, it, it's literally like a laser disc, but mm -hmm. Um, it fits on a CD this size, okay. but there's there's um, hardware in here to uncompress that video fast enough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you'll see this kind of technology taking over on the network, right. so you'll be able to watch video 
over networks and mm -hmm, stuff. So mm -hmm. it's sort of a fun way of doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And one other thing with this in the sales yeah. arena is we can take this information and chop it up, and we can produce CD-ROMs that then we hand out at oh, the tears. trade shows. Sure. Actually, so I've gotten some of those. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, at the last ITVA video festival, we all got a CD-ROM. OK. Thing. And they, yeah. you'll, you'll find uh, you'll be getting more and more mm -hmm. um, because they're easy to produce mm -hmm. uh, and cost effective. Mm -hmm. they're very cheap, cheap for, yeah. for handouts. Yeah. Well, obviously, there's a lot of ways that you can use this stuff, but there's an mm -hmm. awful lot of stuff to learn mm -hmm. for many of us. Um, how do we find out about these kinds of things? What are the, where can we go to learn more? Maybe you can start with that, Tom. Well, if you want to learn how to make it, uh -huh. <laughs> then I would suggest you come over to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are all kinds of people involved in creating interactive multimedia. Mm -hmm. You have to have video people. You have to have uh, graphic designers, illustrators, script writers, screenwriters, um, all of those mm -hmm. different skills. They all fit together. Right. And so you can learn all of those kinds of skills at the college. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. You learn how to do animation mm -hmm. uh, and those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, if you want to just um, find out about what's out there, there's mm -hmm. a number of professional organizations mm -hmm. like the International Interactive Communication Society. Mm -hmm. And we have this information, too, on uh, phone number information right. on the screen, too. And I'm just going to interrupt you because, okay. of course, we're out of time. I knew this was going to happen. But um, the IICS, the International Interactive Communication Society, uh, you can call 934-4234. Uh, ITVA, International Television Association. Tim, quickly, you're doing a workshop or a meeting with there them. There will be a meeting in mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, mid-January. Yeah. And if you need more information, you have the number. Yeah. Uh, they can mm -hmm. call the ITVA. And it will be a joint meeting with IICS. Yeah, that number is 927-8747. And the meeting is on January 25th. And Tim is going to be okay. leading that discussion. Yeah. So that should be fun. There are also a couple of other organizations. One is called Millennium. You should mm -hmm. have the phone number there. And then also the Multimedia Roundtable. And you can call my office, 67 and 32947 for that information. Well, I just want to thank you both for bringing this, the fun toys along. It's Thanks. been great for me to see how some of this stuff is working. I think it's real important for our community and for the business community to, um, mm -hmm. to be in tune with this and to be rolling along. And I know it is with MCAD leading the way with our students and Cray on the business side. We, uh, we're doing really well. And I thank you both for being here. Thanks. Thank you. you bet. It's a pleasure being here. Thanks. Well, Phil welcomes Bane Belke from the Jungle Theater next. And first, though, we'll have a c clip from the Jungle's Gertrude and Alice. Your hand, my dear. If you'll come here tomorrow, I'll take you for a walk in the Luxembourg Gardens, Miss Toplos. That is very kind of you, I'm sure, <laughs> Miss Stein. It's not kind at all. <laughs> I like walking, and I like the gardens, and perhaps you. Perhaps you as well, Miss Toplos. <laughs> well, that was just a little look at uh, the Jungle Theater's Gertrude and Alice, and we're going to take a little longer look at that uh, with my next guest here. Somebody I'm excited to have on the show is Bain Belke, who is an actor, director, and I would say the guiding light behind, maybe the guiding light in the Jungle Theater. So Bain, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Phil. Nice to have you here. Mm -hmm. nice um, as we were sitting and that little clip was going on there, we were talking a little bit about some of your early days, in fact, some of your early dreams about mm -hmm. theater. And you are from Minnesota, way up north. Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit about what cued you into thinking about theater? Uh, well, I was born and raised in Warroad, Minnesota, up on the Canadian border, on Lake of the Woods, hockey town. Yeah, that's right. And um, now the home of Marvin Windows, which is an international yeah. window making company. But when I was a boy, it was Marvin Lumber and Cedar, and it was the lumber yard. So the city, that, not the city, the town has changed a great deal. When I was there, there were only maybe 1,200 people in the town. My father was the superintendent of schools. And um, I can remember as a boy looking around in the small town and trying to imagine what I would do 
for my life, you know, for my work. And mm. I knew that it wasn't working in the variety store, in Rouse's variety store, and I knew it wasn't working at the mercantile, and I knew it wasn't working at the gas station, but the uh, alternatives were few. And we had a little movie theater, the Fox Theater, that I went to every Friday night, which was my night to go, and sometimes Sunday matinees. But early on, I hit upon the idea of the theater, and especially in that I felt a kind of life as a child within me, a kind of emotional life and an energy that I really didn't see displayed in the community activity. And when I hit upon the theater, I realized that this was a place, a kind of sanctuary in a way, where uh, the kind of energies and feelings that, I, that were within me could be expressed mm -hmm. and live there. And then later, of course, as I got older and uh, became more familiar with playwrights, I realized that the great minds of our collective history had written for the theater. And so all of the great ideas and perspectives mm -hmm. on community and perspectives on the human condition and so forth throughout the years, over the centuries, were a part of the theater's world. Mm -hmm. And so that cemented things for me, I guess. So it was a life of not only uh, work, possibly what you would do for a living, but it was the life of the mind as well. Exactly. The yeah. life of, the, of my own imagination yeah. and my own spirit. It really was a place where... I uh, felt that I could grow and have a kind of communication and involvement with other people that was at once intimate and at the same time universal, if you will, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that had a beginning and an end, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've been in the theater all my life from when I was a boy. I've never really wavered from that. I went to... Uh, when I was a sophomore in high school, I was still in Warroad, and I went to the University of Minnesota for the um, summer workshop there that Dr. Arthur Ballot oh, sure. was in charge of. And um, that was really cemented things for me. I remember when I first, uh, this was 1955, this was before the Guthrie, there were only four theaters in town, and the University Theater was really mm -hmm. the, you know, the home of the classics, and it was the theater that was reviewed by the star and Tribune. There were two mm -hmm. newspapers in those days, of course. And um, I remember that summer they were doing a production of Othello that Frank Whiting had directed. And it was so um, awesome to me, just the scenic design and the scope of it all. And I can remember going backstage and then seeing the illusion and the, that these arches and things were really flats and so forth. And it was really um, the beginning of a kind of vision, I suppose, for the mm -hmm. theater for me, because I understood it immediately, you know. Well, and then a few years later, you were in the inaugural production at the famous Minnesota Centennial Showboat. Exactly. Yeah. We did a production of Under the Gaslight, yeah. which is a wonderful melodrama. It has all the classic scenes in it, the railroad, the railroad, the, the heroine tied to the tracks and the train <laughs> coming. Great. and great. villain, Bike. Yeah. and a uh, villainess, old Judas. Mm. And then it also dealt with class issues. There were the rich and the poor and mm. the dock workers and the, you know, it was a wonderful play. I'd like to do it at the Jungle Theater someday. Yeah. Um, but then I also was, that was, the, that was the inaugural production. Then I went, I was in the Army for three years and when I came back, I um, was in the a production of Under the Gaslight again that played in repertory with Camille. Yeah. And that was the year when the Guthrie came to town. Yeah. I remember Tyrone Guthrie being around the showboat and so Caldwell uh, rode down the showboat to Red Wing because the showboat traveled in those yeah. days. Yeah. And we played in Hastings and played in the river towns down, yeah. down a ways. So. We lived on the showboat. And That's right, upstairs really there, there are some places to bunk, mm -hmm. as I recall. In the lobby, the blue yeah. lobby. Yeah. We had our bedrolls in uh, cedar chests that were in the lobby during that performance. That was a nice way to spend a, a summer. Yeah. Those were exciting days, of course. Yeah. There was so much on the horizon yeah. also because uh, the 60s was just beginning and mm -hmm. the civil rights movement and the great sort of shift in the mm -hmm. country's uh, conscience was mm -hmm. on the horizon and you could feel something coming. But, of course, I can sp for myself, I had no um, history at all or understanding of social change. Mm -hmm. 
And so it was really quite, uh, it was a lot of um, hope, I yeah. guess. Well, then you spent, after that, and I'm jumping around here a little mm -hmm. bit, but you spent over 10 years with uh, what we now know as Children's Theatre Company. Exactly. I was yeah. a uh, core member of the company, which um, included myself, Wendy Laird, John Donahue, of course, was the mm. director of it, and yeah. great creative energy behind that theater in those days. And that was very exciting yeah. because, of course, that was the 60s beginning, and there, and there was this huge burgeoning uh, the theater community on the horizon here in Minneapolis. And after the Guthrie came, of course, there were, I mean, theaters appeared everywhere right. as right. if they dropped from the air. Yeah. And by the, by the early 70s, there were maybe, I suppose, 70 theaters in town. Well, we've only got a few more moments, and I wanted to take a peek maybe right now at uh, another clip from the show. You're going to restage mm -hmm. uh, Gertrude and Alice, which you had done in 93, I believe. That's correct. We've done it twice. We okay. did it once at the Jungle, and then it was restaged at the Theater Garage. Oh. In this, as a summer production. Okay, so this will be the third go-around. This will be the third. Well, let's take a look at a couple moments here from uh, Gertrude and Alice, and then we'll come back and maybe talk about the jungle and why you like to restage shows. Okay. Uh, Miss Stein, I'm afraid your writings haven't We're weathered okay. the Atlantic crossing I didn't realize too well. This is the third, yeah. This is the third. Yes, I'm I aware of that. Would mm -hmm. you care to comment on this? Lack of popular success in America is the least of my worries. I am working for what will endure, not for a public. Once you have a public, you're never free. Early success is killing. According to your bio, Miss Stein, you're 56 years old. Perhaps I am. <laughs> well then, any success you might have could not then be called early, could it? those of us at 56 who have only just begun to hit our stride and then there are others at your age whatever that young age is who have already sunk into a closed dotage <laughs> uh, to the average reader Miss Stein your style is totally comprehensible all this foolishness about my writing being mystic or impressionistic is so stupid. Just a lot of rot. I write as clear, straight, grammatical English as anyone, more accurate grammatically than most. <laughs> there is not a single one of my sentences a child could not diagram, with the possible exception of yourself. <laughs> Very well then, Miss Stein. I'd like to ask you to comment on this expatriate business. Now you listen to me, young lady. You don't know anything about it. Don't, don't you dare call me an expatriate. I am more American than you could ever hope to be. I have generations of Americans behind me. Americanism is born in me. Well, well that was a quick look at uh, just a couple moments from what will be a restaging of Gertrude and Alice with, I understand, the same actors? Yes, Claudia Wilkins, uh, who plays Gertrude Stein, and Barbara Kingsley, who essays uh, Alice B. Toklas. Yeah, wonderful portrayal. Yes, I like they that are, a lot. both of them. We've got less than a minute, but uh -huh. before we go, I want to make sure we mention where and when this is being staged again. It will be at the uh, Ordway McKnight Theater, mm -hmm. and it opens January 27th okay. and plays for a limited run, six weeks. Yeah. And uh, you can get tickets for it by calling the Ordway box office. Mm -hmm. It plays Wednesday through Sunday. Great. Evening with a Sunday matinee at 2 o'clock. Wonderful. There's so much more we could talk about why you like to restage shows. Mm -hmm. um, there were also uh, a couple of other theaters you were involved in, uh, the Met mm -hmm. and the Palace, which mm -hmm. are two of my favorite companies. Exactly. But, but we're going to have to have you back on to talk about those chapters in your life, and also Puerto Vallarta. Yeah, I'd I love understand. to. understand that's where the jungle came to your mind. Yeah, right. There's a dream there. Mm -hmm. So, Bain, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Phil. Okay, we'll look for Gertrude and Alice. Good. Okay. Well, folks, we'll be back uh, in a moment. Uh, we're going to have a quick clip from Webster School in Northeast Minneapolis with some young dancers, which will be featured in our last segment of the show. Uh, but right away, I'll be back with Gretchen Nichols from the Loring neighborhood to talk about arts and what's going on in that neighborhood. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come by and see if you're really, really frozen. And if you're really, really frozen, I should be able to move you. Whoops. You should be able to move. Let's try it this way. Upside down? Do you think upside down? Do you think she could stay really, really frozen? <laughs> And you know,
know, I think I know exactly how that little kid felt. It was when I was looking at that multimedia stuff that Janet had on the first segment. It, it just goes too far for me. I'm excited to have our next guest on here. It's a woman with whom I've worked a little bit over the years, and I sat with her in a committee that she chaired for the Citizens for Loring Park Community. They were drafting their action plan, which is part of the NRP planning process. I want to introduce Gretchen Nichols. Thanks for being on the show, by the way. Thank you, Phil. Glad to have you here. And one of the things that really impressed me about the Loring Park effort was that, as many neighborhoods are doing right now, they're making these big and somewhat complicated plans for how to really uh, increase the viability of their neighborhood. Loring Park, early on, decided to include the arts. Now, to start, what was your role in this? How did you come to be part of that action plan? Well, I've been among the leadership of the neighborhood organization, CLPC, for a few years now. And when we were presented with the challenge to plan through the Neighborhood Revitalization Program, uh, it's a chance for a community to speak on behalf of the people that live there to define what character their community has, what uh, strengths they feel their community has, how can we enhance who we are. Yeah. And certainly the arts is a focal point for the Loring Park neighborhood. Well, it's so. a tremendous neighborhood. I mean, when you th if I can give some borders here that the general viewing audience might recognize. I mean, the Walker and the Guthrie are on the western edge. Yeah. You've got Orchestra Hall over on the downtown side of the neighborhood. But there's a ton inside the neighborhood as well, directly. We're surrounded, yeah. but we also are a district unto ourselves, and we're, we are trying to express ourselves as a Loring Arts District through our Neighborhood Action Plan. Yeah. Now you brought some pictures. Why don't we go right to that and get a little sort of a walking tour, if you will, Great. of Loring Park. Now again, this is sort of Minneapolis's Central Park. What are we looking at here? Well, I think it's helpful for people to find the visualization of our community. This is a picture of our park, which is a, one of our greatest amenities. And uh, we all consider it our backyard. Yeah. So it kind of helps to establish the sense of openness, the sense of community that we feel in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Our neighborhood is full of small theaters and arts organizations, galleries, and uh, this is one in particular, the Loring Playhouse um, on the Fox Block, and it draws people from all corners of the city. Very so successful, I might add. Yeah, yeah, they're all wonderful. Sure. Uh, amenities to our neighborhood. This is the Minneapolis Community College. Now, this is a place in which students study film, and study uh, arts-oriented types of things. And we're, we are actually trying to engage students in working with the community to investigate arts through our community. Uh, and so I know in the, in the Whitney Fine Arts Building, there's a nice theater space in there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a wonderful way of, of bringing many resources within the community to produce something yeah. of value. Yeah. And moving along? And here we have the city of Minneapolis. Uh, we are on the southern border. And as you pointed out, we're surrounded by many um, very powerful art institutions. So mm -hmm. this is just a, an expression yeah. of that. Nice skyline shot there. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of the music box, which used to be the Cricket Theater on Nicollet Avenue. And this was a great draw for theater goers in the city. And you may know, I'm not sure if this is true, was it not originally built as a vaudeville house, or was it always a oh, movie yeah. theater? The whole Nicollet Avenue stretch was very much a, they had the flame, old flame bar, which I understood yes. attracted many wonderful performers and uh, ballrooms and all sorts of things. So yeah, uh, the mm -hmm. history of that avenue is quite important for the okay. arts. There are galleries all along Nicollet Avenue and it's even infiltrating even more so into the neighborhood. I've noticed that some galleries seem to be popping up along Nicollet, mm -hmm. uh, sort of down near uh, Orchestra Hall, uh, kind of maybe at the expense almost of the Warehouse District. We yes. seem to have less there and more on South the Nicollet. The momentum is from Warehouse into Loring, yeah. which is an interesting statement and I think connected to the fact that the Convention Center is down on our end of the neighborhood. So if I can use the word, there's a market there. There might be. There might be. And this is one of our uh, statues outside of Westminster Presbyterian oh, yeah. Church. This is the Paul Granlund. I know this. I looked this up. Oh, good. Birth of Freedom. It's wonderful. He's known for a lot of his local things. And our wonderful Burger Fountain. Yeah. We all love it. It's very dear to us in our park. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to mention, let's see, that was... Um, the artist by that was uh, Robert Woodward. Mm -hmm. I looked these things up. You know, so. Good for you. All right, anyhow, moving along. This is one of my favorite pieces of Old public art. Bull. Yeah, yeah. Now, Standing there. people may not know, Jacob Feldy was the artist. He did this around the turn of the century. He also did the Minnehaha Hiawatha statue down mm -hmm. in Minnehaha Park. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of Minneapolis history yes. there. Well, thanks. That's a nice little uh, sort of walking little tour. little walk through our neighborhood. Yeah. As you can see, it's full of many artistic types of things. Yeah. and in 
it makes it important. Well, now, as part of the action plan, uh, the arts have, are, a, are a chapter unto themselves, but you have certain goals, certain major goals within it. Do you want to talk a little bit about what those goals are? Well, the planning effort that surrounded uh, the discussion about arts in Loring began with the defining of a vision. And that vision was for arts to create a unique identity for the Loring neighborhood that will enhance its visibility area-wide through increased exposure to the arts. This vision will celebrate the arts as an integral part of this community as well as foster partnerships among artists, local residents, businesses, organizations and institutions, visitors in other neighborhoods. So we started with a big picture. Mm -hmm. This is what we wanted to create. From there we moved into identifying three major goals. The first was to increase the access to the arts. The second was to increase the art in the park and in the neighborhood. And third was to build communication and networks within the arts mm -hmm. communities. Let's get into some details in a moment, but, but first I want to set the stage a little bit. You had great participation in mm -hmm. this group. Can you kind of just outline some of the sure. people that came and worked with you on this? We originated the process by uh, sending out some information to all of the arts organizations and uh, uh, businesses in the, in the neighborhood. Uh, the Guthrie and the Walker, even though they're not in the neighborhood, we feel we're connected in part to what a neighborhood does. Orchestra Hall, all of the galleries, all of the art theaters and, and whatnot and told them we were having this discussion. We also made this uh, information available to all the residents so all residents could come and participate. But we found mostly it was the organizations that wanted to participate in this because mm -hmm. they had a real investment in the arts. I know Red Eye was involved. The Red Eye Theater was very What for me was a happy surprise was the Basilica. They had someone that came over yes. because they do a lot of programming They there. do. In fact, uh, they were trying to establish a big festival uh, in, yeah. in celebration of the history of their church. And, uh, yeah. So that was exciting and, and, and interesting yeah. that they could make the connection w between the arts and their institution. In indeed. That well, let's go back to some of the issues here that uh, come up with some of the goals because it, it's not an easy challenge. I mean, you know what you want to do, but how do you make it happen? Yes. Well, the increasing the access to the arts, we tried to f identify what was going on around us and how can we connect it together. Uh, the city is putting together a rubber rubber wheeled trolley that will be moving around the city uh, from the convention center. We said, well, that trolley should be going through our neighborhood. It should be going by the sculpture garden. What a great opportunity to bring visitors to the city and show them this part of the city. That's part of our action plan. We wanted to develop pedestrian walkways with flower baskets and banners mm -hmm. that are developed by the artists. In fact, Anchorage, Alaska, uh, has actually has flower baskets and they make a wonderful streetscape and yes. helps to really build a sense of oh, that's color, a nice shot. Yeah. color and uh, artistic feeling to mm -hmm. the corridors. Um, so then we you know, might want to bring in street uh, musicians or street players in the, in the neighbors to help build the sense of corridors connecting the different commercial and art nodes within the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Uh, we wanted to build kiosks and signage that were designed by artists to help develop a s further sense of art in, as a piece of the character of the neighborhood. Uh, and we also wanted to develop a, s a membership card where uh, arts organizations could have discounts for residents to see some of their shows at a, at a discounted rate and s kind of help build a sense of community and own ownership within That's a great idea to get the neighbors involved with some of the facilities and venues that are right, right there. Exactly. Nice idea. Yeah. We're hoping well, so. We've got a couple moments left. Um, what are some of the, and you've done a lot of work preparing mm -hmm. for this. Uh, it seems well thought out. You're making great use of what's already there and kind of imagine some of the things that aren't there that maybe would help. Um, you did mention, I think, a pavilion you wanted to put mm -hmm. on, uh, put right in the middle of the park. Uh, we would like to encourage, we have many huge, wonderful festivals in our, in our uh, neighborhood, and we'd like to enhance that by building a greater pavilion that can be a, a place where people can perform or have music and, and really in, in enjoy the park. Uh, right. Also, we're talking about how history and art connect. So the Red Eye Theater has proposed bringing in students to do a video about the current history of the neighborhood and really really be creative in how we interpret who we are today nice. as a historical piece for the future. Nice idea. And also painting murals through the community helps establish a sense of Yeah, there are art. a few blank walls there, I've noticed. <laughs> yeah. Just a couple. It's great. We hope to take care of that. Yeah, wonderful. What are some of the big challenges? I mean, in order to get this done, what's the next step? What, what does CLPC, the neighborhood organization, need to do or to see happen? Now that we've put on paper all of these ideas that work towards advancing our concept of a Loring Arts District. 
Uh, we need to start figuring out how to implement those ideas. The Neighborhood Revitalization Program offers that opportunity through funding um, of NRP dollars. However, uh, it's been made fairly clear that NRP dollars are not necessarily best used in art. Yeah. So we will have to address that challenge and uh, try to find other ways of funding s stuff like this, either through, through the foundations within our city, through mm -hmm. other grant programs. And we're hoping that the city will eventually understand that art is an extremely important component to many neighborhoods and that they maybe should rethink that, uh, that willingness to, pr to help provide fundings for these types of projects in communities. Well, great. I, I completely support the idea. Mm. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Phil. Good overview of what's going on in Loring Park. Thanks. Thank great. you very much. Well, now, Wendy Ansley and Michael Engel are my next guests, and they'll be right here after we take a look at this fascinating factoid about the arts. And we're back, and sort of in keeping with this next segment, we put up a, a factoid there about uh, the CAP program and how many school districts throughout Minnesota are involved in planning for the arts. And with me are two people who have not only taught in probably a great number of Minnesota schools, um, but are also uh, working with dance curriculum in the Minneapolis School District. I want to welcome uh, Michael Engel. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Phil. And Wendy Ansley. Hi. Great. Nice to have you both here. Um, earlier in the show, uh, we got a, just a little teaser of a couple moments of you teaching um, some kids up at Webster School in Northeast, and in a few moments we'll take a, another longer look at uh, some of that. So you guys are busy. Yes. Very. In fact, I think you guys hold the record for how long it's taken us, us to get a guest on Artifacts. And I talked with you about a year and a half ago. You guys travel. You're all over the state. We're over mm -hmm. Minnesota, North Dakota, some South Dakota. Wow. Yeah. That's great. And primarily doing what? Teaching dance in the public schools. Yeah. Probably over 100 schools in Minnesota. Wow. We've always wondered how many. <laughs> so <laughs> we've, we've never, counting. we have a big map in our kitchen or near our kitchen yeah. that has uh, all these little pins for every town we've taught in. And we've never counted all the pins. But you've actually done that? Because they keep falling out. Yeah, yeah, we have the pins. I always wanted to do that with my old performing group because it would have been fascinating to see where you show up. Well, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so you get up there. How do you get funded for this? I mean, do the schools bring you in? Mostly the schools bring us in through funding with the Minnesota Center for Arts Education. Okay. Um, and also through the Minnesota State Arts Board. Yeah. We're on the roster for the State Arts Board, have been for 10 years. Yeah, I was looking at an old roster and I think you were in there separately at one point. We're still in there separately. Oh, you still are? Okay. <laughs> we used to be together in a, in a roster called Arts Midwest, yeah. which is yeah. a different uh, performing arts roster. Okay. But the teaching rosters, they keep them separate. All right. Just, yeah. So does that ever happen that you go out individually then? Not all the time. Oh, all the time. Okay, yeah. so that's kind of the, yeah. the standard. We do, I'm not sure how much we do together. We do a fair share, but uh, most schools can't afford to bring in a, two artists I for so. certainly the time. Yeah. Michael, how'd you get into dancing? You've been doing this a while. I didn't, well, I didn't start dancing until I was 20. And when I mention that to students that I'm teaching, they go, no, really? And they're, they're kind of surprised. And it was surprising to me, I think, at the time, but now it's not that surprising. Um, basically, I took a dance class when I was in college. Ah. There was nothing in North Dakota where I grew up. Because you wanted never, to be girls. Never, well, actually, <laughs> I was shy of dance and girls. And I thought, well, I'll take a class, and maybe that will get over my shyness. And um, took one and ended up taking another and another. And after a while, I decided to change my career, or oh. my major, to dance, basically. Yeah. What yeah. had you been majoring in? I'd been majoring in education. Oh, okay. Well, great connection then yeah, with dance too, education. Yeah. I kind of combined the two in the major. So. Well, now this could become a soap opera if you say that's where you met Wendy. No. We didn't meet, no. <laughs> we no. Met, I met Wendy about 10 years after I started dancing. Yeah. Yeah. But it was in the context of dance, though? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah. An audition for Bill T. Jones. Oh. Well, how did you get started? Let's just kind of finish that thought. Okay. Off um, I actually started when I was very young. And my mother was going to graduate school at a Catholic university and needed a place to drop me off. Uh -huh. And so I started with nuns and habits 
who taught dancing and dance. habits. <laughs> who taught she did dance. dance and habits. They oh, taught yes, dance. Did, yes. They taught dance with uh, ballet records, and they would oh. lift up their habits and show you what to do, and then they'd drop their habits. Wow! And you started a new and habit. We start <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's quite impressive. <laughs> so, from from the the fields of North Dakota. Yes. And some Catholic school somewhere in Chicago. In Chicago, okay. Big city girl. But it's what was the magnet away. in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis-St. Paul that drew Michael and Wendy inexorably towards sharing a life of dance? Um, the climate of Minneapolis. Very, yeah. Yeah, very yes. much so. Well, Minneapolis. Yeah. I've been I've been traveling through Minneapolis as a kid. My parents had relatives here. I had relatives yeah. here, so the town was very familiar to me. Yeah. Um, and to come here to live and work or to take, go to school was a very, very easy decision. And the cultural opportunities were yeah. there, and let's take a shot at it. Yeah. Well, I traveled all over the country, and people would say, go to Minneapolis. Okay, and so you did, and you met each so, other. Now, yeah. I'm very interested to know, at a time when the arts are often cut in education, and I'm talking nationally, not pinpointing a given district here, but you are working on dance curriculum with the Minneapolis schools. Can you talk a little bit about what it is they have you do? and? What you're offering them? Well, right now we've been hired by one school, okay. Webster Open School, and we're developing a program for kindergarten through eighth grade students. And it's called a creative arts program, so it's drama, dance, and creative writing. Oh, okay. And we're, what's exciting about this is that it's not a grant or it's not a special program. Mm -hmm. It's in the school. It's integrated into their it's whole program. It's integrated mm -hmm. into the program. Wow. We see all the kids yes. um, over the school year. Different, different lengths of time for different classes, mm -hmm. but uh, it's part of, yeah, it's a specialist, like a music specialist or a art or a media specialist, we're the dance drama specialists. And the curriculum that we're developing is based on somewhat on our curriculum that we've developed over the 15 years that we've taught in the schools, but it's also trying to, we're using it for ourselves as a, as a place to, to really try to use a lot of ideas that we've used and bring them to a much stronger place for ourselves in our teaching mm -hmm. so that we, because um, we've never been able to work with a group of kids like this over, over a, a long period, period of time. time. We always come into a school for two weeks and then we're gone. So it's a great workshop for you too as well. Yeah. yeah. How well, on, we on that note, let's take a look. Our crew, as they often do, and they do a great job, went up to Northeast Minneapolis to Webster School and caught a class Wendy happened to be mm -hmm. teaching. And it was great fun. And we'll see maybe a few of those techniques that Michael's talking about.
That was a lot of fun, and I can tell that everybody in that room's having fun when you guys are there. But you said something interesting as we were watching it, that what the one of the goals of the principal is of the school. Was he asked that we build community, yeah. that that be one of the things that we work on. Yeah, and you do that so through these techniques of sharing and interacting. And working together, really yeah. emphasizing working together, like in that rubber that's band. That's Everyone's holding on, everyone has to do it together, it doesn't work. Or even the other thing that they were doing, the down in the valley dance. They have to find another partner. Dance is such a social, right. all kinds of dance, whether it's the kind that we're doing or folk dances. Yeah. Such a social um, kind of environment or, or task. You're mm -hmm. trying to connect with people. You're trying to accomplish a task with somebody. Stay on beat. Yeah. Change when you're supposed to change. And Hold hands. very visual. <laughs> Yeah, without yeah, there's real touching. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's touching. And it's, and it's a language that isn't like, isn't words. It's a language that's it's much more basic. It's, it's yeah. rhythmic. It's spatial. It's musical. And we have many children who don't speak English or don't speak very well. So this is something that they can do, that they can fit in. Yeah. Now this sequence will go through the entire academic year. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what, what, when May or June, whenever the school year gets over, what do you two as teachers hope these kids will come out of it with? The community, obviously. What, what do you think will happen? Well, we actually, there, we have classes, some classes we only have for four weeks every day. Oh. Others we have, like they have, they're on a trimester basis, three 12-week trimester mm -hmm. basis. So a lot of kids we'll see for 12 weeks, and we'll get a new batch for 12. But whatever basis, at the end of the school year, um, at the end of a 12-week period, I think we, mo we mostly want the kids to come away with a better sense, a, a better sense of self-confidence in themselves as movers, as actors, uh, a sense of other, others in their classroom working together, mm -hmm. of that kind of cooperative effort it takes to succeed. Mm -hmm. Those are the, you know, technique and, and uh, whether they're great orators or great leapers, you know, those would be nice things, but yeah. just everybody, whether it's yeah. the person in the wheelchair, the Hmong student that can't, uh, you know, doesn't know that much English, they all have the ability to do that kind of. Do the parents get a chance to come in and see um, some We're of the We're starting work? that. Are we you? haven't gotten to that. Um, we've done little mini we've shows. Done, we do mini shows in the schools. Mm -hmm. And we've been, school. we've been invited to the Minnesota Zoo with um, 300 children from a different school, from Northrop Urban Environmental School. My We're going to do a big performance at the Three, zoo. Uh, the, I, 300. I think it's an appropriate venue for 300 <laughs> kids. That's going to be great. Yeah. When will that be later in the year? That'll be in May. Wow. Well, yeah. we'll look for that. Yeah. You're so busy doing this, and, you, and do you uh, occasionally also still go out to another district somewhere in North Dakota mm -hmm. or Minnesota? Mm -hmm. We were in North we Dakota earlier this year. We have to go back later this year. Wow. Um, what I've got jobs starting in January in other schools, so Wendy has to cover my classes for me yeah. then. This, this job at, at Webster came kind of out of the blue just before school started. So we still have contracts for other schools suppose, yeah. that we're yeah. trying to finish up. Next year we hope to just focus mostly on our commitment to Webster. So you will be back next year to Webster? Yeah, well, if, hopefully. hopefully. If they still want us, if we still want to teach there, yeah. and if the money is, the specialist position is still yeah. open. Well, best of luck. It sounds like very good work and important work for the, the young people. And what a great commitment by the school. I really give them credit for doing that. Yeah, yeah. So. I think so, too. Um, one last quick question. When you're this busy teaching, you must not have much chance to actually perform. Do you, do you get out and perform much, or is that pretty much a thing of the past? No, it's not. No. <laughs> it's not a thing of the past. I don't <laughs> want it to be. A, I haven't had a chance to perform since last June, July. But oh, well, oh we no, performed we performed in, in September. September. <laughs> what am I thinking of? We did. Sure, 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 you performed. Yeah. Just, sure. You yes. got a lot of other things you got to do right. in between. Yeah, we hope to yeah. continue that. It's uh, yeah. kind of a little bit taking a little break while we get our feet settled here. Yeah. Well, congratulations. It's good work. Thank Thanks for being on the show, Wendy. Thank nice you. to have you here. Michael, good Thank to see you. you. So I really support that, and if you're in a, you have an opportunity to tell your school that maybe it would be a good idea to think about something like these two are doing with dance in their school, uh, don't be shy. Give that school a call. Now, Jan will be back with me uh, in a moment to help wrap up this edition of Artifacts, but first we've got a fun fact talking about a new movie that's going to come to town and film right here in the Twin Cities.
Well, we've come to the close of another fine show. Indeed, and we've got another fine show lined up for February. Yep, we're going to have Kim McCarty on from the people of Phillips. That neighborhood has also included the arts in their NRP planning process. Mm -hmm. And I'll be talking with some TV commercial producing folks about the always exciting AICP Grip Rodeo. The world's toughest rodeo, that is. <laughs> Yeehaw! <laughs> now, <laughs> the events calendar is next, and we'll see you next month. We thank you for joining us. Thanks for stopping by. I'm Janet Sun. And I'm still the normal Phil <laughs> Lindsay, and this has been Artifacts. The events calendar. Don Juan Giovanni. Storytelling and folklore. Financial seminar. Take the money train. Free young ride. What do they use, like the booms, or what do they use the equipment? Oh, they have, you know, guessed the equipment in the camera bag contest. They've got, they have to, oh, they do all sorts of really weird right. stuff. It's really fun. Um, they do, uh, what did they do last year? I can't remember. But it's a rodeo. It's a rodeo. It's, yeah. it's using the equipment of the film business right. in, in different contests and stuff. It's okay. very fun. All right. I've seen the bus drivers do that. They back the buses up and <laughs> yeah. this and that. And it's kind of the same thing, yeah. only it's, it's all in great fun. And the deal this year is that if you actually work in the particular field in which the piece, like if you're, if you're a dolly operator, you can't compete in any of the dolly um, oh, so you, you can't play right. to your strength. That's right. So you got to go use the grip. you got to do the other stuff. What is the grip? What is the grip? Well, I know well, what a grip is. That's the person. Yeah. But they're... Four.